Welcome to Whiskey Cast, cask strength conversation featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 958 for June 26th, 2022. Coming up in a few minutes. Take three of your favorite scotches that have very different flavor profiles and, and pinch your nose shut and sip them and let it, you know, move it around in your mouth and, and then unplug your nose um, and see what happens. If you can have somebody else blind you too, to see if you could tell them the difference between the scotches uh, before and, and after unplugging the nose, um, it's kind of a fun little exercise. As whiskey lovers, we depend on our noses to help us enjoy a whiskey. If you don't believe that, then try Dr. Paul Wise's trick. He's a researcher at the Monell Chemical Senses Center in Philadelphia and an expert on how our noses process aromas. He'll explain just what happens in our heads when we nose a glass of whiskey on Whiskey Cast in depth. That's just ahead, along with the What I'm Tasting This Week department, your voice behind the label, and... It is one of the most beautiful distilleries on, uh, on, in Scotland. And every time I go past it, you know, you come around the little bend and you suddenly see it. It's just always breathtaking and it's always, wow, that is pretty, you know. And I've been past it more than a hundred times and every time I say the same, wow, it's pretty, wow, it's good. The news is next on this week's Whiskey Cast. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. Small batch. How would you describe it? It's like an Irishman's understanding of baseball. Extremely limited. Proud sponsor of WhiskeyCast. Redbreast. Pass it on. Hey friends, Gabriel Cartarella with Jewers. Whiskey and golf, a match made in Scotland. Whether you shot a 72 or a 92, whiskey has its place after every day on the course. Which is why I'm excited to introduce to you your new favorite round after a round, Dewar's 19-Year-Old Champions Edition. A special 19-year whiskey finished in first fill rye and new American oak barrels. Let's get started with the news. It's brought to you by the Dalmore. We'll start in Scotland, where Elixir Distillers has acquired the Tormor Distillery in Speyside from Chivas Brothers. No purchase price was disclosed, but the deal includes Tormor's maturing stocks of single malt whiskey. Under Chivas Brothers and its previous owners, Tormor has primarily been used for blending purposes, with the exception of some 14- and 16-year-old bottlings for the French market. Those whiskies will be retired as stocks run dry, but Sikinder Singh told me this week that the long-term plans for Tormor definitely focus on releasing a new single malt range over time. I knew that the big distilleries are impossible. Um, and this is the one actually I had my eye on. So I'm very, very happy. Extremely happy. Um, you know, when you look at Tormor, it is one of the most beautiful distilleries on uh, on in Scotland, and every time I go past it, you know, you come around the little bend and you suddenly see it. It's just always breathtaking, and it's always wow, that is pretty, you know. And I've been past it more than a hundred times, and every time I say the same, wow, it's pretty, wow, it's good. But more importantly, as you know. We're liquid people. We love whiskey. We've been doing whiskey for a long time. Our passion is in whiskey. The liquid actually was the most important to me. So I actually didn't care what anything looks like. Of course, it helps, but liquid is the most important. But when you get both, there can be nothing better. So, you know, Tormo is not very well known. It's had a bit of an up and down pass. It's been available on the market in certain decades and then stopped and then back on, then stopped. You know, it's always been with companies who've had other brands which were always more important. So no one ever gave Tor more the love it deserved. And it was always sort of on the back seat and in many ways became a blending mall. Um but for those of us who know independent bottlings of Tormor, 
know how delicious and how good a whiskey it is. And that's why I'm saying I am so happy and really, really excited. How soon will you start bringing expressions of Tormor to the uh, market? Um, it's going to take time, Mark. It's going to take us at least 12 months, you know. I think the first priority is to get to know the distillery, you know, just understanding, making sure whoever comes across with us in terms of the team are happy. We need to understand, go around, look at the distillery, feel the distillery, really get into the heart and soul of the distillery uh, to become friendly with it and to terms with it. And then we've got the big mammoth task of sort of going through the inventory you know, there's, of course, different vintages, there's different wood types, really getting to know it properly before being able to determine, you know, what style uh, or what combination of casks we need to put together to get to what we like uh, so that we can launch it. And then, of course, it's the usual, you know, packaging, design, la la la. That takes a long time. And especially in today's environment where, Packaging constraints, i.e., you know, glass issues, packaging issues, box issues, um, is delaying things a lot. So I think we're going with it without any expectations, without any deadlines or dates, and seeing where our path takes us. But I'd like to say, hopefully, next 12 to 18 months. The exact makeup of the new Tormor range will not be determined until after the Elixir team can evaluate the casks in the distillery's inventory, but it's likely to include a flagship single malt, either in the 12-year-old range or with no age statement, along with limited releases of older whiskies. The deal comes less than a year after Chivas Brothers' parent, Pernod Ricard, acquired the whiskey exchange retail operation from Sikinder and Rajbir Singh, and as construction is just getting underway on their new Port Natruan distillery on Isla. While two big projects like this may seem hard to swallow for a small company like Elixir, Sikinder Singh says the fact that Port Natruan will be under construction for a year and a half before they start to lay down stocks of whiskey gives them time to handle the Tormor acquisition. Another big deal this week, as Sazerac has made a key move to ensure its long-term presence in the Irish whiskey market, the privately held company has acquired the Loch Gill Distillery in County Sligo and will use it to supply whiskey for the Paddy brand, along with reviving the long-idled Michael Collins brand. The distillery will also continue to produce Loch Gill's own Aru Irish whiskey as well. And if that's not all, Sazerac has lured former Bushmills master blender Helen Mulholland out of retirement to serve as master blender for its Irish whiskey portfolio. Once again, no purchase price was announced, and no one from Sazerac was available for interviews this week. Updating a story from last week now, there is still no settlement in the labor dispute between OI Glass and the union representing workers at its three plants in Scotland. Unite the Union has been staging a series of rotating strikes at those plants since talks broke down earlier this month. The plants supply glass bottles to Diageo, Chivas Brothers, Bacardi, and other drinks companies. In other news, the flooding that wiped out much of the infrastructure within Yellowstone National Park earlier this month is prompting support from within the whiskey industry. Last month, we reported that Wyoming Whiskey had released its second National Park Edition bourbon with a goal of raising $150,000 for Yellowstone Forever, the park's official charity partner. Wyoming Whiskey co-founder David DeFazio was my guest Friday night on the Happy Hour Live webcast. I was up in Mammoth for the Yellowstone Forever board meeting on Thursday and Friday before the events, that before the disaster really and everything was totally fine. And to see what happened 48 hours later uh, was remarkable, um, absolutely devastating. So you know, we, we made our commitment. Um, we're donating $150,000 to celebrate the 150th anniversary of Yellowstone. And um, as a result of what's happening up there, we've been able to get our partner Edrington has stepped up and has donated 25000 bucks. Uh, to help Yellowstone Forever's uh, Resiliency Fund, which is a fund that they had opened up during 
uh, COVID to help with employees and, and, you know, basically discretionary needs as they came up. They had closed the fund and is now reopened because of what's happened up there. And uh, we're getting a lot of our partners, uh, the Four Seasons here in Jackson, individuals and whatnot uh, are donating a bunch of money to it. And uh, I'm very thankful for that. In addition, Limestone Branch Distillers in Kentucky is also donating $25,000 to both the National Park Service and the National Parks Conservation Association for relief efforts. Limestone Branch produces the Yellowstone Bourbon brand and will also match up to $50,000 in donations at a fundraising event to be held this Tuesday night in Bozeman, Montana. Irish Distillers has unveiled a new series of American oak bottlings of Redbreast, starting with the debut Kentucky Oak Edition. I had the chance to sit down with Redbreast blender David McCabe recently for a preview. We've gone a bit off-piste on this one with the the finishing technique where we've actually used some virgin American oak, um, which would be, for us, a bit unusual on the Redbreast side of things. As you know, it's very much linked to the sherry cast contribution in terms of flavor we still achieve that but we've kind of added a a top note of new uh, american oak and where that stems from really goes back to 2017 so there's um, a wood forestry management uh, company in in ireland which you'd probably know paddy purser who we work a lot with for the likes of Dar Gaelic for Middleton. Um, and a lot of that work is based on looking at the, the sustainability and the future of Irish oak. Um, but we also look further afield to places like Europe, you know, in Spain and France in particular, always working to see about PEFC, um, which is the Programme for Endorsement of Forestry um, Certification. So back in 2017, Paddy was over in the States doing a bit of a fact-finding mission on American oak sustainability. And he would have attended talks in the University of Kentucky, for example. And he met who we would probably des- describe as the American equivalent of Paddy Purser over there, um, a gentleman by the name of Chris Will. Um, and they got talking and both like minded people always looking at the future uh, of sustainability when it comes to, to hardwoods and um, oak in particular. And Paddy would have mentioned the work that we do in Irish Distillers on that on our side. So Chris had mentioned about uh, the Taylor family in Kentucky and the work that they've been doing um, for nearly six generations uh, on the Elk Cave Farm where they work uh, or the Elk Cave Farm where they're where they're based. And um, so one thing led to another. And, you know, Finbar Curran, who's wood management and and, uh, maturation, went over with Kevin O'Gorman, head distiller met the tailors, got on exceptionally well, and a lot of work then moved on in place to create kind of a, I suppose, a chain of custody where the supplier, being the tailors, who supplied the oak to Kelvin Cooperage for coopering, to then come to us as a customer, that if you can enable that chain of custody within that PEFC certification, uh, it helps maintain that link which shows where exactly the wood was sourced from, where it was manufactured to casks and where we've now held our whiskey in. Uh, and that helps with the sustainability story. So it's been a huge amount of work from mostly an administrative side of it, but it just goes to show that there's a lot of work going on in the background for sustainability that, you know, has been going on for a long time that is really part of what we want to be for the future as much as humanly possible. And it's great to see that there are independent forestry owners who are of the same mindset. So the likes of the tailors. Clifton Taylor will be the father and his wife, Barbara. They, Clifton goes back six generations of having parcels of land in Kentucky. And from the 50s onwards, uh, himself and Barbara were, were buying more land with the idea of creating, I suppose, a better environment for cleaner water, and natural habitat, hardwood timbers. And part of that was to do with a huge amount of oak regeneration. Um, it might sound like that's easy to do, but you bear in mind you've maple and beech always trying to outcompete oak for light, which then reduces the amount of fresh, younger saplings of oak growing. So on a 1,200-acre piece of land, there's a lot of work in trying to maintain that, I suppose, generation upon generation of oak coming through. There'll be a lot of old, matured oak in America, but due to the competing factors of other trees, you mightn't get as much of the younger saplings getting getting to that age in the future. So there's a lot of work with both the, the, with the tailors, with Chris Will, with the University of Kentucky and a few people there, Jeffrey Stringer, for example, Bob Aberman. And, you know, 
when I talk about these people, it's really the work that Finbar and Kevin have done all those years. Um, the the amount of work in the se- behind the scenes that those guys have done is pretty much helping us to, to get where we're going. And from a blending side, we see the, the barrels coming home from what they've done. So for myself and Billy, you know, when it came to this Red Breast exclusive, you know, we are a bit conservative when it comes to Red Breast, as, as you are well aware. Um, but we said, OK, well, this is strictly for America. It's about the relationship we have with the American customers, consumers, but also the oak suppliers, because we often overlook the importance of American oak in the making of Red Breast, but it actually makes up a huge amount of the formulation. And we always talk about the, the sherry cask providence from a, a flavor point of view. Um, so it's, it's time to give American oak the bit of credit it deserves when it comes to Red Breast. The Red Breast Kentucky Oak Edition carries a recommended retail price of $95.99 a bottle and is a U.S. exclusive. I'll have my tasting notes for it later on. Other new whiskeys announced this week. Louisville's Rabbit Hole is out with the fourth edition in its Founders Collection series. Nivalier is a 16-year-old bourbon finished for a year in new French oak barrels. 1,155 bottles will be available. The recommended retail price is $895 each. Virginia's Catoctin Creek is releasing its latest Ragnarok Rye on Monday. It's produced in collaboration with the heavy metal band Guar and comes out just as the band's new album is being released. The bottles also have collectible toppers representing each of the band's five members. 1,000 cases will be available. The recommended retail price is $99 a bottle. The Lakes Distillery in England is releasing a new Manzanilla cask finish version of The One. It's blended whiskey that combines the distillery's own single malt with grain and malt scotch whiskeys from the Highlands, Speyside, and Isla. It's available in the UK with a recommended retail price of £47.95 a bottle. And Canada's Macaloni's Island Distillery is out with three new triple distilled Irish style pot still whiskeys. Kille, Kildara, and Kirk and Riola are the first time the late Dr. Jim Swan's distilling methods have been tried on triple distilled pot still whiskeys. Kirk and Riola is matured in ex Moscatel wine casks, while the other two expressions use a variety of ex sherry, ex bourbon, and virgin American oak casks. They're available exclusively in Canada. No word on pricing. You can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. The news is brought to you by the Dalmore. Hello, Richard Patterson here, master distiller, master blender for the Dalmore. You know, whenever the team and I are in the world sharing our exceptional single malt, we like to keep in touch with Mark Gillespie and the latest news from Whiskey Cast. If you missed Friday night's Happy Hour live webcast with David DeFazio of Wyoming Whiskey, the on-demand replay is available now at the WhiskeyCast YouTube channel, and we'll have the podcast version out later this week. Join us Friday nights at 5 p.m. New York time for the live webcasts on our YouTube channel, our Facebook page, Twitter, and Twitch. Time now for the Whiskey Cast calendar of events brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling. The Kiddish Fest Worlds of Whiskey Brew and Q takes place Thursday night at the Hudson Yards Synagogue in New York City. The Black Bourbon Society's Open Door Tour hits Charlotte, North Carolina this coming weekend, followed by Houston, Texas next weekend. The National Whiskey Festival is this Saturday in Inverness, Scotland, along with the Independent Whiskey Market in Birmingham, England. McTeers has its next whiskey auction July 8th in Glasgow. The Whiskey Rebellion Festival takes place July 8th and 9th in Washington, Pennsylvania. And Whiskey Live Sydney is July 15th and 16th in Australia. If you're organizing a whiskey event, let us know about it, and we'll add it to the searchable calendar at whiskeycast.com. It's brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling, makers of the Virginia Rye Whiskey. You'll find their Roundstone Rye at fine whiskey shops in 26 U.S. states, three continents, and online. Visit the new buyvirginiarye.com site for more details, and please drink responsibly.
Doers Champions Edition 19 Year was produced in partnership with the USGA by Master Blender Stephanie McLeod for the 122nd U.S. Open to commemorate the site at Brookline where American Francis We Met won the legendary 19th U.S. Open in 1913, sparking a golf boom in the United States. Prior to bottling, this limited edition 19-year whiskey goes through Dewar's time-honored double aging process and then takes things up a notch by being finished in new American oak barrels and first fill rye casts. The result? Well, a scotch whiskey that is as rich and complex as the great game of golf. Dewar's 19 years about celebrating those days on the links, bonding with friends and family, forging new friendships, and hopefully keeping on the short stuff and out of the cabbage. This whiskey honors the U.S. Open's mantra of from many, one. From many barrels, one truly championship whiskey. Whiskey Cast In Depth is brought to you by Mortlock and the Classic Malts lineup. What's more important, the mouth or the nose when it comes to enjoying a whiskey? Our tongue can only detect five different varieties of flavors. Salty, sweet, bitter, sour, and umami while the nose is capable of parsing out hundreds of different aromas. That's why nosing skills are so prized among whiskey blenders and connoisseurs. Now, Dr. Paul Wise is just your average whiskey consumer, but he knows more about how the nose works than most of us combined. He's a researcher at the Monell Chemical Senses Center in Philadelphia and focuses on how the body perceives sensory inputs. You know, like the aroma of a whiskey. I spent some time with him on a Zoom call this week. So what does the nose perceive when we stick our nose into a glass of whiskey? How do we perceive that whiskey with uh, our senses? Well, when when you smell, you're going to get two sensory systems activated over a glass of whiskey. So you have smell, which has about 400 different receptors in the nose. Um, Each one tuned to a different series of of a different uh, uh, group of molecules. Uh, And it's the pattern of these receptors that are active that gives you the the perceived quality. Um, And of course, everything your brain does with that. Um, But the, the smell portion is most of flavor. So there's only a few things that taste sour and I'm sorry, there's, there's many things that taste sour and salty and sweet. Um, There's only a, a, you know, only one thing that for instance, tastes like an orange um, so that so mo- most of your whiskey impact is going to be through smell. Uh, you're going to be activating through the ethanol and possibly other compounds, but I would suspect mainly through the ethanol. Uh, another sensory system, which is a subset of your skin senses or your your touch system. So free nerve endings in the nose um, are sensitive to temperature, pain, uh, and also some chemicals. Uh, and in fact, one of the one of the molecular receptors that gives a sensitivity to ethanol in that system is the, one of the, the same the same one that gives a sensitivity to capsaicin and hot chili peppers. Is that why we perceive a burn in alcohol? At least a good part of it. There may be other mechanisms involved, but yes, um, it's it's stimulating some of the same systems that a hot chili pepper would. And then what happens once it hits the nose and hits the olfactory glands? Uh, that, those are the two things. So it goes next to um, uh, first relay in the brain of, of smell information is the olfactory bulb where signals are sharpened uh, and tuned. Uh, then it goes to higher uh, brain processing areas where you get the conscious perception of flavor uh, and your emotional responses to it. Um, a lot more is known about what's going on at the nose than what's going on in the brain. Is it fair to say that, uh, I've said this for years and I could be wrong, and I hope you'll tell me if I am, that really smells are mental memories that we make with uh, associating things with the past, with things we've smelled in the past, once it gets to our brain. Is that fair to say? Yeah, there's a whole, there's a whole theory of olfaction that, that, that olfaction is about activating these memory engrams. Um, and in fact, if you activate the right memory engram, you can fill in some missing blanks, um, similar to the way perception works in other areas. Um, so uh, I, I guess I will give maybe one relevant anti- antidote going back to how smell really comprises more of flavor than most people appreciate. Um, we had uh, an expert distiller and a whiskey writer um, visiting Monell 
and their their topic of interest was pairings. So what 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 foods go well with whiskey? Uh, but we were playing around with some of the same tools we we do for visitors, and one one is a nose clip, just the same one you'd use for spirometry um, to close the nose, and it blocks airflow through the nose and prevents volatiles from getting up through the nose. And uh, uh, these these folks were they they knew already about the importance of smell already, of course, but. They were still surprised that not only could they, with nose clips on, and, and we put a blindfold on too, uh, not to tell the difference, say, between a, a, a kind of a honey and a PD scotch. Um, they were having trouble telling the difference between scotch and a 40% solution of pure ethanol. Um, so anyway, that's uh, going back. That's jumping back a topic, but it's, uh, yeah. But that's something that we can replicate at home with a clothespin, right? Or just pinch your nose shut with your fingers like that. Um, and it's something everybody's experienced when they have a cold um, and their, their nose is blocked by congestion. But yes, that would be, that would be a, a really good exercise. Take three of your favorite scotches that have very different flavor profiles and, and pinch your nose shut and sip them and let it, you know, move it around in your mouth and, and then unplug your nose um, and see what happens. If you can have somebody else blind you too, to see if you could tell them the difference between the scotches um, before and, and after unplugging the nose, um, it's kind of a fun little exercise. How does the nose perceive, and this is a question from Tyrone Cote in Nova Scotia, how does the nose perceive higher strength whiskey, um, i.e. nose feel? Is there, can the nose perceive differences in strengths between whiskeys? Uh, between different ethanol contents. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. I'm not a hundred percent sure what the difference in ethanol concentration would be to just notice a difference in burn level. Um, you would, you, I, I would suspect, although I don't know, um, that that might, that, that it, that it won't be huge, maybe like a 20% difference, but I, I don't know if anybody's ever measured that people have measured, thresholds for ethanol or what's the minimum amount you can detect. Um, uh, and, but as far as I, I'm, I'm sure somebody's measured a difference threshold. Say you start at 40% and creep up and find the minimum increase you can detect, but I can't offhand think of anybody who's done that with ethanol. The technique for this is kind of interesting. So the brain completely integrates the two nostrils for smell. So if you can just smell something, uh, so the exercise is we give you odorized air in one nostril and clean air in the other nostril. And your job is not to say whether you smell something, your job is to say which nostril got the vapor. And if you can smell it, but not feel it, you're completely unable to do this. Now, that's a little controversial, but you're la- at least largely unable to do this. But once you can feel it as well as smell it at a higher concentration, usually for most compounds, um, uh, then it's, then it's stimulating feel. Um, that's more information than you probably wanted, but that's, that's, that's how we measure a, a, a minimum, uh, level for feel in the nose. No, cause it uh, brings up a, another good question. Why are we susceptible to some aromas and not others? For instance, I don't smell sulfur in a lot of whiskeys and it's been suggested that, uh, genetics may play a role in this, but, uh, why do we not smell certain compounds or, or some of us can smell certain things and others can't? Yeah. I mean, it, large, a, a lot of these are known to be due to, in, to genetic differences. So it's, you have um, neurons in your nose uh, that are responsible for detecting smell. Uh, each one of those neurons expresses a particular type of olfactory receptor protein. And these olfactory receptor proteins are similar in a lot of ways to taste receptors and receptors for neurotransmitters and various other chemical receptors. Uh, So we have 350, 400 of these different ones that humans express, Uh, but there are genetic differences, right? So we don't all express the same form of each one. Uh, And sometimes it has functional consequences um, so that, that people might, people with a particular form of the receptor Um, might either be completely unable to detect something and they call that a specific anosmia anosmia being lack of smell Uh, or um, you have a hole in the pattern of the receptors you 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 that normally detect that molecule right 
So you might be able to smell it, but it might smell completely different to you than it does to other people. Um, so there, there are examples of those. Um, but a lot of the cases where people don't seem to be able to smell something uh, particular, a lot of times we don't know what, what genetic mutation is responsible for that, but we hypothesize that it's, that it is some genetic mutation. Another question from uh, at Bunkai H. How quickly do our olfactory senses get fatigued during nosing? Uh, how quickly do we go nose blind? Uh, yeah, within within a few sniffs, you you lose a lot of sensitivity. Um, so if you picture a, an exponential decay function or a downward swoop, um, and then within it, like a couple of minutes, you, you can have a fairly profound loss. Uh, you recover pretty quickly to most of your sensitivity pretty quickly if you give yourself a break. Um, I know I generally don't taste more than six whiskeys in a flight before I'll stop and take a break. And that's with taking some time in between each one. But uh, after six, I've found my nose gets to be pretty well blown out. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I, I haven't done whiskey tasting, but I've had this. And I think there's also, in addition, in addition to things not smelling as strong, I think there's a fading towards pastel phenomenon. I mean, I remember as I was a graduate student, I was doing an experiment with really different odors like lemon, cherry, clove, um, et cetera. And uh, I wasn't sure about some labels on some bottles that I was making. So I thought, oh, no big deal. It's, 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 it's clove and cherry. I should just be able to sniff these things and tell. But, you know, I'd been working with this stuff for a few minutes and yeah, I, I wasn't able to tell anymore. So I, I think there's a loss of, I think there's a loss of intensity and I think there may be a, a kind of a fading to a fading of pat, towards pastel, at least for a lot of things. How did you decide to study senses and study the sense of smell as your career path? Uh yeah, the, the kind of thing that, that I, I, w- I was an experimental psychology major, both as a graduate student and ar- undergraduate. One of the things that grabbed me most in class was a, was a quote from Isaac Newton talking about the, the different wavelengths of light giving rise to color. And he said that, you know, the wavelengths themselves are not colored. And, if, and, you, and it's simple, but so profound that it's a physical property, but the brain is creating something out of that physical property. Um, that doesn't exist in the world that exists only in our brain. Um, and that, that's, that was always quite fascinating to me. Um, and so I got into color vision that way. Uh, and uh, how I got into smell and chemical senses a little bit different. Um, I wish it was something noble, but um, none of the graduate students in vision were getting jobs. Um, and uh, the few people that I knew that were studying chemical senses, if they couldn't get academic jobs, they were getting snapped up by the food and beverage and personal products industries. Um, so anyway, it's, I wish it was more noble than that. <laughs> uh, Nothing wrong with that. Uh, one other question from Bunk IH. Yeah. You're familiar with these whiskey nosing charts that uh, correspond to different aromas with different chemical compounds in a whiskey. Do they map well to the chemical groups that our noses can detect, or do they primarily impact by triggered memories when you're smelling something? Yeah, I have to admit that I'm not greatly familiar with the whiskey wheels and and some of the other specialized vocabulary. Um, I can tell you that most of those are not formed based on chemical class, although they may, re- they may refer to chemical classes as examples like ethereal or or, or solvent-like or something like that. Uh, but most of those are most of those are done focus group style, where you get a panel of raters that you know that you taste something and and negotiate to agreement on what's a good term for that. Um, so most of those are not most of those are based kind of coming from the 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 perceptual or subjective side and less coming from the chemical side. But I have to admit I, I don't know as much about the whiskey wheels. And you've said you do drink whiskey, you do enjoy it. Uh, how does your professional sense of smell um, come into play when you're just enjoying a glass of whiskey? I have to admit, um, I, I, I've always thought more about the uh, the burn part. Um, 
And, uh, you know, how, for instance, as I'm drinking it, how, how, how burn develops as I spread it around the mouth, what's the time course of that? Um, what's the effect of touching different surfaces of the mouth? So I'm thinking about interactions between touch and, and chemically induced feel. Um, but, uh, the smell, I, I'm afraid I, I, my, my appreciation is more like a naive consumer. Um, I like peaty scotches. Um, I like other scotches too, um, but I'm afraid that's more the, mostly the way that I, I just enjoy it like everyone else. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that at all. Um, is there a way to train yourself to become a better noser? Can nosing skills be taught or is it something you're born with? Oh, yeah. Good question. Um, you can certainly, you can certainly learn and train up, um, to, to recognize and you become more consistent, uh, and you can make finer distinctions. That's, that's possible. Um, whether there's an innate inherent limit on that, um, at at one extreme, some people are just born with bad noses. Um, so, you know, you're, you're not going to be a perfumer or sommelier or, or uh, what's, what's the corresponding word for a, a whiskey, a nerd. Okay. That works too. But yeah, basically. Um, but I, I think probably most people could learn quite a bit. Um, there's another phenomenon though. That's the, that I'm sure you've heard in wine that I've always found interesting. Um, you can take sommeliers and have them taste a bunch of wines blind and give them a white wine with a drop of food coloring and of the same white wine without the food coloring. And these experts will use typical red wine type descriptors more often for the, for the wine with the drop of food coloring in it than from the same wine without. Um, so yeah, maybe, maybe because I'm not a super nose myself, I'm, I'm at best an average nose. Um, but, uh, I, I've always, uh, I've always wondered a little bit, um, uh, you know, how much is, how much is the brain, the brain kind of imposing order on what it smells versus, um, you know, versus really teasing apart physical characteristics that are there. I'm sure there, there's, there's both going on at the same time. It's interesting because it seems as though you're, as you put it, the brain is trying to impose order, but we're going with a preconceived notion of what we think it's supposed to smell like. And there's two, I mean, it's, it's, uh, in, in general, um, well, the, the, the phenomenon I like, I like to, I like to, I like to demonstrate is with a banana odor, like a artificial banana extract. If you give somebody that blind, um, a lot of people will say it's fruity, but they won't be able to say, they won't know exactly what it is. But if you tell them that it's supposed to be banana, all of a sudden there's a, there's a, there's, there's a transformation. Um, and again, maybe it's activating the right engram, the in- memory pattern, and it's filling in the blanks. Um, so uh, I, I think, you know, that's very clear. On the other hand, um, if you push it too far, um, it won't fit, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, so if, 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 you, if you expect something to taste a certain way and, it's made, and it tastes very different, that's going to be jarring. Um, an example of that is, uh, it, this is very, this is personal, but I think most people have this kind of experience. Um, we have in this house often um, unsweetened barley tea and apple juice in the refrigerator at different times, and I love both of them. Um, but if I'm expecting one and get the other, there's going to be a moment of shock. Um, so anyway, there's some limits, and uh, there's, of course, some limits as, as to what the, the brain can do to impose order. This is a good question that's been controversial for a number of years. Is there a difference in the sensitivity of olfactory glands and the number of those glands between men and women? Are women perceived as better nosers than men because there's a stereotype that women have more sensitive olfactory glands and they're better nosers because of that? Right. I mean, anybody that collects a large enough sample does that analysis um, between men and women. And I can say that when there's a difference, it's almost always in favor of women being slightly more sensitive. But there's not always a difference. In fact, often there's not. Um, So, you know, I would say that probably there is a small mean difference between men and women that women are slightly better. 
but you're talking about two bell curves, right? That are superimposed. Um, so allow me to make a gesture. I mean, they're going to be, <laughs> they're going to be overlapping largely. So there's a small mean difference. Um, but, but the differences within men and within women are going to be huge relative to the different, you know, any difference between men and women. You mentioned specific anosmia earlier, and people have become very familiar with the, the concept of anosmia thanks to the COVID pandemic. Is the virus actually affecting our olfactory glands and those receptors, or how does it work, or do we know yet? Yeah, at least part of it is is it's it's doing something to the cell, the the the, old, the cells that we don't know quite what yet, but it's affecting the way chromosomes interact, and it's it's actually affecting the the expression of those receptor proteins. Um, so, although it doesn't affect it doesn't affect infect the olfactory receptor cells themselves. Um, by some mechanism, when it's effect, infecting other cells, that in turn affects the olfactory cells. Um, so, you know, part of it, it's, in, it's infecting the tissue around those olfactory receptor neurons. I guess I should have started with, a, with definitions. So olfactory receptor neurons are the cells in the nose that are sensitive to smell, and then the olfactory receptor proteins um, are the, the, the actual receptors those express. So, you know, so a particular olfactory receptor uh, 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 would not be as likely to be expressed. So lo- lower level. Yeah. So it's actually knocking down the machinery right there at the periphery. It might also be doing some things in the brain, too. Um, uh, you know, uh, so anyway, it's 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 probably a multi whammy uh, when it has an effect. What do we still not know about how the nose works? and how the sense of smell works? Uh, well, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, we, we still don't know um, for most of the olfactory receptor proteins, the exact range of molecules to which they're sensitive. Um, and we, we don't know the, the fundamental first order question of what features of a molecule are detected by those olfactory receptors. So e- still, um, if you present somebody with a molecule um, based on its structure, you're not necessarily you, you're not necessarily going to know what that smells like. So that that fundamental code of 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 how the how 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 the olfactory receptors decode the molecular features uh, is unknown, and there's also a lot unknown about how the brain processes that. Um, so, you know, lot, lots to study still. And just for those people who are not familiar, which I'm assuming is probably most of our audience, tell us about the Monell Chemical Sciences Center and what sure. research you do there. Very broad, but all, all, any, basically we, 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 we study anything having to do with how sensory systems detect chemicals and how that affects health and behavior. Uh, most of it is taste and smell, but we also study chemical irritation like burn uh, we study chemical sensing in the gut and in the airways. Um, so uh, we are a private nonprofit. Um, we started uh, under University of Pennsylvania, but spun off. Uh, and but we remain independent to this day. Um, about a third of our funding or so comes from uh, government grants. Um, no, you know, uh, maybe maybe 40, 45 percent. I, I should get the latest figure. Uh, another good chunk is from um, unrestricted gifts from industry partners. Um, so, so uh, usually food, fl- food, beverage, ingredients, and personal products industries, uh, in- including some uh, in- that uh, that uh, that make distilled spirits. Um, last, uh, last I checked, uh, and uh, you know we also we have a another chunk from um, state and and uh, uh, other agencies. So we're a private nonprofit. You mentioned working with the distilled spirits industry. How good is whiskey as a way to evaluate one's nosing ability or to do some of this research compared to uh, wine or other substances, uh, given that there are a lot of different aromas within a glass of whiskey? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I, I hadn't, I haven't spent any time thinking about that and I haven't used it as a, I haven't used it as a stimulus. Um, 
I'll tell you, most of what we do, we, we, we work with very, very simple model systems. Um, we're trying to discern kind of fundamental rules and build on that. Um, we also will work with foods and beverages uh, sometimes, um, but things are just so much more complicated in those systems. Um, you get multiple, you know, chemical interactions and also sensory interactions. Um, it can it can be tough to di- it can be tough to discern any general rules, starting with a complex beverage, for instance. I would imagine it must be interesting when you guys sit down on a Friday night after the end of the work week and uh, pull out an adult beverage of your choice to uh, sit down and, and just enjoy it. It would be an interesting conversation, I would imagine. Yeah, even if we're well, I, I can tell you the chemical senses people do tend to do tend to do, do tend to appreciate good food and drink. Um, although we not we're not always talking shop while we while we do it. There's a link for the Monell Chemical Senses Center in our show notes for this episode at whiskeycast.com. And if you have questions after listening to this interview, send them along and we'll try to get Dr. Wise to answer them. That's Whiskey Cast in depth. It's brought to you by Mortlock, whiskey's best kept secret, hidden away for decades in some of the world's most famous Scotch whiskies. Comes a single malt inspired by an original for a fortunate few. Discover the entire Mortlock lineup at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. I'm working my way slowly back into tasting after recovering from COVID. But I did have a chance to taste the new Redbreast Kentucky Oak Edition recently. It's bottled at 50.5% ABV. The nose has a good balance of cinnamon, sandalwood, plums, pears, apricots, and roasted coffee beans, along with a hint of hazelnut. The taste has cinnamon and other baking spices, balanced by a hint of oak tannins, along with figs, dates, and orange peel in the background that come out as the spices fade. Adding water opens up a touch of clove on the palate while lengthening the spices and reducing the astringency a bit. The finish is long and luscious with a nice combination of fruits and spice, and I'm scoring the Redbreast Kentucky Yolk Edition a 95. Now, let's look at the Wyoming Whiskey National Park's number 2 bourbon that I mentioned during the news. This one is a 5-year-old bourbon bottled at 52.5% ABV. The nose has notes of sandalwood, orange custard, and a hint of grilled peaches. The taste has wood spices complemented by toffee, salted caramel, chocolate, and honey, while the finish is long with hints of citrus, ground peppercorns, and a soft oakiness. I'm scoring the Wyoming Whiskey National Parks number 2 a 93. Had the chance to talk off mic with Ian Summerhalter of Brothers Bond Bourbon while I was in New Orleans this month for the Discus Conference. Brothers Bond is coming out with a new cask strength edition bottled at 59% ABV. The nose has notes of banana bread, tobacco leaves, peaches, brown sugar, honey, and oak. The taste is thick, chewy, and spicy with notes of tobacco, baking spices, a nice balance of dried fruits, and just a hint of honey. The finish is long and spicy with a touch of cherries, and I'm scoring the Brothers Bond Cask Strength Bourbon a 93. Our tasting notes are brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey. They're reviving the tradition of Maryland-style rye at their waterfront distillery in Baltimore. Their premium canned cocktails are a refreshing, convenient option while you're playing a round of golf, sitting poolside, or enjoying a day at the beach with flavors such as lemon tea fizz and honey paloma. Now available in markets across the U.S., you can find them at a retailer near you. Just visit sagamorespirit.com slash find rye. Please drink responsibly. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. So, in Spain, they call Redbreast Petit Rocco. It's me, but a touch more exotic, kind of like a Redbreast PX edition, finished in Pedro Jimenez casks, adding a velvety and decadent dimension. You know, I won't lie, a climate like this makes me wish I was a migratory bird. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast, Redbreast. Pass it on. Let's check the inbox now for your voice, presented by Scarabus Isla Single Malt Scotch Whiskey. 
Once again, thanks to everyone who sent along their wishes for a speedy recovery during my recent experience with COVID. I really do appreciate it. We did have one question that came in during the webcast Friday night with David DeFazio of Wyoming Whiskey that I did not see until after the webcast had ended. Ivan Stoller asked, I'm curious about ownership. Did they expand on their own or with VC money? Well, DeFazio's partners made their money in ranching and didn't take a dime of venture capital money in the early years of Wyoming Whiskey. They funded it basically out of pocket. Several years ago, they sold a minority stake in the company to Edrington and presumably have been reinvesting profits back into expanding the distillery's production capacity the last couple of years. Ivan, I hope that answers your question. And if you have a question, suggestion, or anything else you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always find me on social media. Look for WhiskeyCast on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, or just email me. The address is comments at whiskeycast.com. Your voice is presented by Scarabus, the Isla single malt from Hunter Lang & Company that celebrates all of Isla's natural gifts in one bottle. Only those who seek shall find Scarabus. Start your search at hunterlang.com. Let's close out the show now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and people who make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. Last Tuesday, we celebrated the summer solstice in the Northern Hemisphere and the start of summer. Of course, those south of the equator are just beginning winter as we speak. But this Friday, we mark another change of seasons. No, it's not the shortest summer on record, but July 1st is the official first day of the fall distilling season in the U.S. Federal regulations divide the year into two seasons— Fall runs from July 1st through December 31st, and the spring distilling season runs from January 1st through June 30th. Why is this important? Well, except for a certain amount of record-keeping, the most important thing is its significance for those who want to make bottled and bond whiskeys. Because one of the key requirements is that all of the whiskey that goes into a bottled and bond expression has to be distilled during the same season. That's one of the many reasons why distillers track each barrel they produce, so that four years later they're getting all of the proper barrels together to create that bottled and bond whiskey. So, happy fall! If there's something you'd like to see us look at on an upcoming episode, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot an 18th century style of premium Irish whiskey, blended from single pot still and single malt. Like yourself, it's one of life's treasured rarities, and what's rare is wonderful. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. That's all for this edition of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find the latest whiskey news, my tasting notes, the calendar of events, the whiskey photo of the week, cocktail recipes, and of course a complete archive of all of our past episodes going all the way back to 2005. Get in touch with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WhiskeyCast. The email address, comments at WhiskeyCast.com. I can't think of a better way to celebrate a round of whiskey cast or golf than with a Dewar's 19-year-old Champions Edition. Here's to another round, friends. Cheers. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. You know, people always ask me, does Redbreast go better with ice or without? Would it go well with figs, dark chocolate, apple crumble? Is there one particular thing I should enjoy it with? I tell them, yeah, other people. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2022, and comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.